Hi, today we're briefly going to go over smooth muscle contraction. This diagram and subsequent diagrams come from cvphysiology.com. I highly recommend that website and the accompanying book to learn anything about the cardiovascular system and its basic physiology. So this diagram here is a smooth muscle cell. Now, similar to your skeletal muscle cells, you have myosin. Let me see if I can get this. You have myosin in your smooth muscle uh, and actin. And the interaction between actin and myosin is what causes smooth muscle contraction. But how we get that actin and myosin to interact is a little bit different in smooth muscle than it is in skeletal muscle. If you remember in skeletal muscle, calcium binds to troponin, which helps move tropomyosin, thereby exposing binding sites for myosin on the actin. Well, in, in smooth muscle, we have a different setup. What's going to start and stop the contraction is actually this protein structure here called myosin light chain. It's on top of the myosin head. And if you want contraction, you need to have that myosin head phosphorylated, meaning that you've stuck a phosphate on the myosin light chain. Once you do that, that's what helps get the interaction between the actin and the myosin. And then with ATP, it, it powers the, the power stroke. So how do we get phosphate on the myosin head? Well, there's an enzyme here called myosin light chain kinase. And its job is to, when it's activated, it will put a phosphate on and cause contraction. So if we want smooth muscle contraction and vasoconstriction, we have to activate myosin light chain kinase, which is going to occur typically by activating an enzyme called calmodulin. So calmodulin is floating around in the smooth muscle and it's sensitive to levels of calcium. As soon as calcium levels increase in the smooth muscle cell, either by calcium coming in from the outside or from calcium leaving the SR, we'll get that calcium activating calmodulin, which then stimulates myosin light chain kinase, which will put the phosphate on the myosin head. So we still have calcium being involved in the contraction in the smooth muscle, but it's in a different way. The calcium is stimulating calmodulin, which then stimulates myosin light chain kinase, which phosphorylates the myosin head and causes contraction. We don't have the, the, the troponin, tropomyosin, calcium setup in here. So really, if you want to cause contraction, what you're going to do is increase calcium levels. So that could be by having levels of calcium come in from these L-type calcium channels, which is a common way, or by causing or the calcium channels causing the release of calcium from the SR, which will stimulate the calmodulin also. Now we also have another thing here. How do we stop the contraction? It's great to contract, but you also need to relax. And so the way you relax is with the opposite enzyme of myosin light chain kinase. So myosin light chain kinase puts the phosphate on. This enzyme, myosin light chain phosphatase, takes the phosphate off and ends the contraction. So if you want to stop a contraction, you activate this myosin light chain phosphatase, or you could make sure that you have no calcium in the cell so it doesn't stimulate this pathway and get the myosin light chain kinase going. Now let's look at some of the common signaling mechanisms here. One common signaling mechanism or one way that smooth muscles regulate their tone or how contracted they are is with an indwelling or natural pressure tension sensors. Uh, the exact mechanism in this isn't entirely clear, but what this is called is myogenic tone. These sensors within the, the smooth muscle cell can tell how stretched or relaxed the smooth muscle is. And if it's too stretched or too relaxed, it will adjust how much calcium is coming in and 
regulate vascular tone accordingly. Another way that you can adjust the vascular tone is with the sympathetic stimulation. So you have a lot of sympathetic activation or sympathetic nerves innervating the arterioles. Not a ton of parasympathetic, but a lot of sympathetic. And within skeletal muscle, most of your receptors for sympathetic nerves are alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. So that'll bind your norepinephrine and start a signaling cascade. The norepinephrine will bind to the alpha-1 receptor, which is coupled with a certain G protein, which then goes through a couple of signaling things that causes calcium to come out of the SR and stimulate the calmodulin system. So based off of that, what would alpha-1 adrenergic receptors do? They would cause a vasocontraction. You also have other, other hormones that will do this. This is endothelin A or endothelin 1, uh, endothelin A receptor, and that will also stimulate vasocontraction very potently. What other ways do you have of stimulating or controlling vascular tone? Another way that the norepinephrine or the sympathetic tone will work is by binding to the alpha-1 adrenergic receptor, hitting up that G protein, which will then set up a whole different uh, enzyme cascade with something called rho kinase. So I don't really care that you know that, but just watch what's going on. So the G protein is going to stimulate myosin or inhibit myosin light chain phosphatase. So remember, myosin light chain phosphatase is taking the phosphate off. So this enzyme will cause relaxation. So if you inhibit it, as indicated by that negative sign, if you inhibit myosin light chain phosphatase, you'll get more potent contraction or vasoconstriction. Same thing with ETA receptors. Now, ooh, that was a lot at once. So now we'll look at what's going on up here. Another way of doing things is with the beta receptors, you have these beta-2 receptors, which will also bind to norepinephrine and epinephrine. Uh, you have beta-2 receptors a little bit in the, the arterioles of your skeletal muscle and throughout the body, but mostly they're way far outweighed by these alpha receptors, alpha-1 and alpha-2, which will result in basic contraction. But you have these beta-2 receptors a lot in the coronary arteries. And so you, if you have sympathetic activity in the coronary arteries, that norepinephrine will bind the beta receptor, which is coupled with a G protein that stimulates cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP then inhibits myosin light chain kinase. So you're, it's turning off or slowing down the enzyme that causes contraction. So beta-2 receptor stimulation should cause vasorelaxation or vasodilation. On the flip side, your alpha-2 adrenergic receptors, they inhibit cyclic AMP, which will favor contraction. Now for everyone's favorite and everybody's favorite signaling molecule, nitric oxide. So a lot of nitric oxide is going to come from the endothelium, but other sources uh, exist as well. So let's just assume this nitric oxide is coming from the endothelium. That nitric oxide is going to diffuse into the smooth muscle cell and stimulate an enzyme called guanylate cyclase, the GC, guanylate cyclase, which converts GTP into cyclic GMP. And that cyclic GMP triggers or starts myosin light chain phosphatase. So if we just simul uh, simplify this pathway, nitric oxide stimulates myosin light chain phosphatase which takes phosphate off of the myosin head, causing relaxation. So nitric oxide should cause vasodilation or relaxation. So the nitric oxide, I guess, you could look at it this way, works on the myosin light chain phosphatase in the opposite way is the alpha-1 adrenergic rokinase pathway. So these are different ways that you can, uh, can get vasocontraction or relaxation. If you want more, I encourage you to go look up a couple more YouTube videos or go to cdphysiology.com.